Well, Eric, it's great to be back in the studio with you. Uh, we were walking through this series called The Greatest Biographies, and we're counting them down. And we, I don't know about you, but the last two, I should, I should even before we even start here, the last two, I can't believe they even hit as low as they did. I well, I think we went over that. <laughs> and if any of the listeners want to go back, they'll understand why they hit lower. Uh, I voted them higher, and you're the one that stuck them in the basement. So, Well, I am very excited for the ones that are coming up. So this yes. is number five. And it's the book, Reese Howell's Intercessor by Norman Grubbs. Yes, which I think my foot may be blocking. I'm not exactly sure here. but uh, <laughs> And this is, I mean, to make it number five in our list, that's quite a statement already. You know, so we can pat the book. Uh, and uh, Norman Grubb uh, wrote the previous one that we did. And Correct. I think we sort of gave a hint towards that, if I remember correctly, uh, sort of saying that it's related to that book. That's true. And I actually made a mistake in the last episode because I mentioned that there were new audiobooks for C.T. Studd and Reese Howells, and there's only a new audiobook for Reese Howells. So well, that's too bad. <laughs> so I totally uh, messed that one up. But there is an audiobook. I just actually listened to it this last week. What do you think? Uh, it? You know, it was, it was freshly invigorating. It's been a long time since I've read the book. But I, I love this idea that here's a very simple Welsh man who God just calls and says, will you obey me? And you just see this incredible picture, very awkward at times, which we want to discuss too. But there's these awkward moments where Reese Hall says, okay, I'm all in. God, if you're asking, I will obey. And you just see this trajectory of a man who learns how to pray, learns how to stand in the gap, and in so doing becomes a man of prayer that actually, it just changes the world. So this book, it goes, it's a pretty goes pretty far back in my spiritual development to the point where when I was in missionary school, I read this book and it had a significant impact on the way I was even viewing my future, my life, my calling. It's like, I want to think in a world changing way. And it's interesting because even today, Ellerslie can't think local. I mean, my entire vision has always been global. And so even our church, our local church is local but with a global purpose. We always say we're after the capital C church. We want to see the capital C church built up and local, you know, the, the lowercase C is that local church, which of course is God's heart too. It's not the absence of that. It's just that we're built to see what this man is describing in this book. It's, it's a very, very powerful book. And I think for both of us, when we were just rehearsing, like, okay, let's let's remember this book. You just went through it, so you're sort of cheating uh, in that <laughs> regard. But I have read this thing so many times that I feel like I can get on board pretty quickly uh, with what's taking place in it. But there is, it, it starts very simple. It's just a simple man, and then he grows up to bigger tests, bigger challenges, and then those challenges grow to the point where. In World War II, he's standing strategically with a prayer college against the movement of the Axis powers and Hitler specifically. That and seeing answered prayer in time with the movements of the Nazis uh, in their uh, in their attempts to take Great Britain through the Battle of Britain and beyond. I mean, it is remarkable. Everything from Dunkirk to the Battle of Britain and all these things. It's like. A prayer college actually was a part of the solution. Uh, and Winston Churchill learned from World War I that there was something about national days of prayer that were very significant. And World War II had, I think, around eight or nine. I, I, I may need to review that again, but World War I, I think, had one. And that was right near the end. And so Winston Churchill began implementing that. And so there was something about prayer that is actually steering the course of history and nations. And I think... That's hard for you and I to overlook. It's like, okay, this matters. Well, you actually see the, you see pieces of this book, even just in the found, founding of Ellerslie itself. There's just that heart of, you know, we've talked for years of like, okay, what would it look like to have a per college? What would it look like to, you know, infuse some of this kind of stuff into a discipleship model that undergirds and strengthens the modern church, but then brings into a place of praying powerfully on behalf of the world around us. Uh, I, I really do love this book. There is some awkwardness in the book though. And I, I love maybe for just a quick discussion on that idea of when we read biographies, so oftentimes we, we are encouraged, we're challenged, but in the midst of that, God can give examples through biographies, but we're not to mimic. Could you talk about that? Just that difference between a prescriptive and descriptive way of reading that I think is really important, especially with a book like Reese Howells. 
Yeah, and there's certain parts. The Bible is the same way. The Bible has prescriptive parts, which is like, this is how you are to live. And then it has other stories, and this is one of the reasons the book of Acts can be a little tricky, is it's descriptive of how the early church implemented those truths. And just because the early church did something specific doesn't always mean a straight across translation to us that we need to do this exact same. Maybe a quick example. My, my favorite one that I give our students for saturation uh, is in Judges where it says Gideon had 80 sons for he had many wives. And I said, amen, <laughs> praise the Lord, you know, and uh, sure, let's, let's, let's do it. And you have to recognize, uh, no, 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 that's just describing what Gideon did. That's not telling yeah. us what we should do. Yeah. Uh, if I can me yes. go on a hype. And that is important, especially yeah. in this book, because it's sort of strange for us to say this is the fifth greatest <laughs> Christian biography of all time, at least according to our voting system, right? And then we immediately start putting warnings out there. It's like, but <laughs> beware. And actually quite a few of our biographies, we would actually stick a little sub, a little label on it to say, but beware of this. And in this one, I think it's critical. We actually, in the very beginning of Ellerslie, had this as reading material. This was, I don't know if mandatory reading is the best way to describe how Ellerslie works, but sort of like that. It's like, hey, if you're going through this, then we're going to go through this book. I don't know how many semesters in it was, but we were like, hmm, actually it is somewhat dangerous because people would take it as prescriptive as opposed to just the description of how one man took the truth of the kingdom of heaven and applied it in his life, which is tremendously encouraging and beautiful and profound. But if you try and live like Reese House, boy, things can get weird really quick. That's very true. Uh, so all that to be said is make sure we're not emulating in, in the sense of mimicking, but let's be encouraged and exhorted by these examples and let God even use the examples to to stir us and bring us to another place of surrender or consecration. Uh, with that being said, what would you say is the, the biggest impact mm -hmm. of this book on your life? It's really hard because that is one of the things you and I have pre-evaluated. In other words, where we come in with an answer. And I do have an answer, but it, I almost feel like I have to give the caveat to say there are so many things in this book that impacted me. Just So to pick one is actually really hard. But I would say there's this one moment in the very beginning uh, where he is learning to stand in the gap. Is, and he's describing it in detail. And he's not the one that wrote the book, but you're getting a lot of his actual quotes and his teachings on it where he was learning to stand on behalf of the weak in prayer. And so he would he would oftentimes identify with their weakness. And so he was helping a, a family uh, whose, I don't know, their parents died. I don't remember the, the circumstance in depth. You probably remember it a little better. And so there's these orphans. Uh, and he's saying, well, God, you're a father to the fatherless. And I just thank you for being a father to the fatherless. And then God is communicating to him that, well, he's the body of Christ. And so therefore... The way that God is a father to the fatherless is through us, and in this case, through Reese Howells. And I remember almost trembling when I was beginning to realize that simple truth, that we can say, oh God, it's so nice that you are these qualities, but it's like, how does he reveal those qualities in this earth, but through us? And of course, the impact, if you follow my life through that, I mean, I have four adopted kids, and so I have genuinely entertained that thought and said, God, I want to be the body of Christ. I want to carry your heart. If you're a father to the fatherless, then do that work through me the same way I saw it worked in him. So the impact on my life, even practically, not just the construction of Ellerslie, which had a huge, this had a huge impact on it as far as our prayer focus and our, our worldwide, you know, perspective, but then even that family side of my life, my marriage and my family of how we have chosen to let's carry the burden of God practically. Mm, that's so good. One of the things I really have appreciated, and we've already kind of alluded to it, is just this idea that what you see in the book that just has deeply blessed me is just a man who says, okay, Lord, I'm all in, but teach me to pray. And what you see is that as God begins to increase his understanding of prayer, his uh, understanding of intercession, God responds to that. And you, you see lives being changed and you see countries being shifted. And I love just that inspiration that prayer is not just this thing that we do as believers. It, it actually works. You know, as James says, prayer, prayer is powerful. It's effective. Uh, so I, I really love that aspect. I also love this idea that and you already mentioned to it, that God ever increases the opportunities in our life for us to show faith. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard as you get into the later parts of this book and you're like, well, how much further could someone go? And God's like, I want you to buy that property. And and I haven't 
I, I meant to even like look at what it would be in our day's economy, but it must have been tens of millions of dollars yeah. for this property. And he's like, okay, sure. And it was like, no problem. With no money. Yeah, yeah, it had no money. <laughs> so I could relate to that part. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just, as, but it's because you walk through a life of faith mm-hmm. and seeing God do all these amazing things. He just said, all right, yeah. God has proven himself in the past. God will continue to prove himself into the future. And, and I love the fact that God, and it, we've talked about this in our lives, God is always giving more opportunities for us to trust him. And, you know, I look back at five years ago and go, well, that actually seems like a vacation. Yeah. What, what I thought was difficulty back then it feels easy now, but it's because I'm in the middle of stuff. And I know that in five years from now that I'll look back at it right now and be like, Oh, if I could just go back there, it'd be like a vacation. <laughs> but I, I love that idea that, you know, like David walked, you know, went from lions and bears to giants to, you know, being surrounded by tens of thousands to, you know, moving mountains and the sky being ripped in half. There's a greater amount of faith that God is always calling us into. Amen. Uh, what would you say is your favorite characteristic about Reese Howells? Uh, I think we may actually agree because we were comparing notes on this. Mine, I called it mountain moving faith. It's not just faith. It's the faith that actually changes the topography of the world, changes history. And that is so impacting through this book. I would say that's definitely a standout uh, characteristic. And maybe if I can just tie in because I totally agree with that. It's the fact that Reese Howells was never trying to grab a hold of something for himself, mm-hmm. uh, that he was always willing to lay down himself not seek the fame and the fortune. He, you know, he wasn't looking to start his own YouTube channel. They didn't have it back then, but you know, in our, in our modern day context, he was just willing for God to be seen. And I, I just love that heart of wanting to make God bigger and bigger as he walks in faith. And for most people, pe- most people don't know Reese Howells in our, in our generation. And I love, I actually love that, that he was changing the world mm-hmm. and yet he's very unknown mm-hmm. uh, to most people. Well, I have, uh, you know, six kids, my youngest child, uh, who is adopted from Haiti his name is Reese. And so if that's, you know, my oldest is Hudson. If they, you know, that gives away some of my heroes in all of this, but, uh, it's, he's a very, very precious man in history. And this book enunciates it in such a profound way. That's true. Well, I'm excited for the next four, uh, that we're coming up on. We have four more. We have huh? four more. Uh. Um, but all that to be said, thank you for listening. Uh, we're going to put a link for this book in the show notes. So if you just want to even help support daily thunder and buy a copy, that'd be great. Uh, but until next time, thanks Eric. It's been a blessing.